Good morning, everyone. Um, you're all very welcome, uh, and thanks very much for being so patient, because I know a lot of you have been here for quite a while already. So, uh, but um, we, we had half, down, half, half 11 down as the start, so we just wanted to make sure any kind of stragglers coming in um, are, are here uh, for the start. So you're all very welcome. Uh, my name is Declan McGarrigal, and I work for the Managing Authority at the Special EU Programmes Body. Um, and today's a very important uh, event and workshop for ourselves. Um, I think this is a, a, the 14th or 15th workshop that we have done across the programme now in terms of the pre-application support that we're offering to potential applicants ahead of calls. So today is about 4.1 um, and around addiction. Uh, and we're going to tell you uh, more about that um, as we move through the workshop uh, this morning. First of all, I'd, I'd like to just welcome um, uh, the people that are at, at our top table, uh, and you're going to hear some more presentations from uh, uh, at today's workshop. So Miriam Ferrin, um, who some of you will be familiar with, um, has been working uh, as one of uh, the providers of the pre-application support in a number of areas of the program, and has kindly agreed uh, to fulfill uh, the responsibility for that under 4.1 addiction as well. We've also got some representatives here from our key partners um, in the two government departments, uh, the two health departments, North and South. So Jacqueline McKevitt um, is here from the Department of Health in Northern Ireland, and we also have Mary Halley from the Department of Health in Ireland. And they're going to tell you a little bit more about the key policy, uh, policy positions and strategies uh, from the department's perspective. Uh, and it's important that you take account of those as you begin to build and develop your application for Peace Plus. So today is really about introducing uh, this particular investment area or this particular area of the program um, to yourselves as potential applicants. Obviously, you're here today because you have an interest, uh, you're working in this area, uh, and that you're keen to see whether a project can be developed uh, in partnership uh, with others on a north-south basis. So we're going to give you um, some of the high level, uh, the, the broad parameters uh, that you will have to build your application around. At this stage, we don't have a full call document, um, which is only really available once the program launches and once we open the call for applications. So this is ahead of that. Um, and as I say, it's really those broad parameters that we're going to give you um, today, uh, and that you'll, you'll, you'll hear about from the various uh, speakers. So, first of all, I'm going to give you a little bit of a context for how we have arrived at this point today in terms of being able to come before you and begin to tell you um, some of those uh, parameters and give you some information around this particular area of the program. So, a bit on the program development process and how we've arrived at this particular point. And then, as I say, um, our speakers from the two government departments, Jacqueline and Mary, then will give you the policies and the strategies that you need to take account of, and also give, will provide you with some insight from the government departments. And we've developed this program, not just in close con uh, consultation with um, the two government departments and fit with um, government strategies and policies north and south, but also over the last number of years with the likes of yourselves, um, citizens, key organizations and key stakeholders as well. So um, later on in the session as well, um, we will have an opportunity for uh, some questions. So if you can, just listen to what we've got to say first. Um, and if you make a note of any questions as we move through the workshop, um, there'll be time at the end of the, the session just to take some questions from the floor. Uh, we will also have uh, frequently asked questions, and we're continuing to build those, and they'll be on our uh, website um, as we move through the next number of months. So it is a constantly evolving process ahead of the call formally opening, where you will see the full call, uh, the full call document, uh, and the various levels of program guidance and rules that you'll need to see ahead of the full application being submitted. But this is a really good opportunity uh, at this stage, really going away from today to come back to Miriam um, in terms of uh, your concepts and your project ideas 
and to get some feedback at this stage. For some of you, it may well be the case that uh, the program isn't for yourselves in terms of fit, in terms of your idea. For others, there will be something there, and Miriam will provide that guidance and that feedback um, that you, you can then take away and then build your proposal further ahead of the calls opening later this year. So how did we get here? Um, we got here with the support of the Northern Ireland Executive, the government departments North and South, um, the government uh, of Ireland, the UK government, and also, of course, the European Union, the European Commission. Um, and it's within their rules, uh, the European Commission's rules and regulatory framework that the programme has been developed. If you look at the programme uh, in terms of the six themes and the, the numerous investment areas, it very much builds upon the current interreg and, and peace programmes. It does have a renewed focus on peace and reconciliation. This is now one single peace programme rather than two uh, programmes that we've um, traditionally managed. And there has to be a contribution there in terms of cross-border uh, development and partnership and also to the wider economic and territorial development of the programme area. And as I said, the programme itself was developed through intensive review, research, and a lot of public engagement, uh, really dating back to 2018 when we started the process of developing the programme. Huge amount of stakeholder engagement uh, leading on from that, with public events, you know, including with um, uh, key stakeholders and key sectoral areas. Um, there was over 400 survey submissions that were submitted uh, to SUPB uh, for consideration. And there was a public consultation then um, a couple of years ago now in 2021, which essentially rubber stamped um, the program, those six themes and the investment areas um, that, that you'll have been able to look at ahead of today. The program area itself um, is Northern Ireland and the border counties of Ireland. At that point, the last bullet point there at the bottom is important because there is the potential uh, for participation of partners from outside the programme area. So where those partners can add value um, to your core partnership within Northern Ireland and Ireland, then that's something which is, which is el eligible uh, for any project coming forward. There's a huge budget um, in excess of 1 billion euros, which has to be committed and allocated to projects over the next number of years. And as I said, there's six themes and 22 investment areas. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But this is a very simple sort of uh, uh, chart that shows really in simplistic form really where Peace Plus is. And it's really that merging in terms of the peace and, and, and prosperity. You know, you've heard this a lot, you know, with the anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement over recent months. Um, but this is what the program's objective is about. It's about building peace and prosperity and every project that's coming forward in all of those investment areas has to take that into consideration. And this is the program uh, and you can see the six themes uh, and for each of those themes there's a financial allocation uh, which will have to be committed over the next number of years. And theme one's really about building peaceful and thriving communities. Um, so a lot of that activity that you would have seen under the current Peace 4 programme, both at a local and regional level, also around shared space, big capital projects uh, as well. Theme 2 is about delivering socio-economic regeneration and transformation. Uh, and you can see a number of areas in there, um, including skills development and also smart towns and villages, but also research and innovation as well. Theme 3 maintains a focus um, from our previous programme period particularly under peace, on our young people uh, and, and, and empowering them and investing uh, in their future. So a lot in terms of shared education, um, both formal and informal in terms of youth provision, but in school settings. Also around youth mental health as well, and also around uh, the Peace Youth Programme, so around skills in our young people as well. Theme four then is healthy and inclusive communities, and that is where um, the investment area 4.1 uh, that we're looking at today falls. An investment area 4.1 is split into two areas, and some of you may have been the previous workshops, uh, which was on the broader health and social care uh, areas that are detailed within the program around acute services and other areas as well. 
But another aspect of 4.1, which we're looking at today, is around addiction, addiction services, treatment services, um, and that also falls within 4.1. Um, and there's 17 million euros available under that particular uh, call or that particular area of the program. There's also under theme for uh, rural regeneration and social inclusion, and also a focus, of course, on victims and survivors. The final two things then are around uh, supporting a sustainable future, uh, which is uh, large capital investment in rail and uh, connectivity, north and south, also around water infrastructure, um, and also around the climate change agenda as well, coastal management, protection of biodiversity. And finally, theme six then is building and embedding partnership and collaboration. And there's over 50 million euros uh, that's available under uh, projects that can come forward, looking at particular challenges and obstacles that exist because of the border um, and how we can address those through partnership working on a north-south uh, basis. The other big flagship element of the program that is important just to make you aware of is our small grants activity. Um, and there's 20 million euros for small grants programs. And when we talk about small grants under the program, it's grants up to 100,000 euros. Um, and that's available under uh, uh, theme one, under empowering communities, uh, and also under 6.2, which is maintaining and forging relationships between citizens. So there's a slightly different focus for each of those, but there's 40 million euros in total available, um, and that should kick in late this year, early next year, and is being managed on behalf of SUPB by uh, Pobal in partnership with um, a Northern Ireland organisation. So again, it's important just to point that out. That's um, going to be a huge level of investment. There's multiple <laughs> projects there um, under 100,000 euros, and there's big opportunity there as well, and I'm sure some of you in the room will uh, be interested in that. So just finally, just in terms of this introductory and so setting things in context, I always think this is a useful slide just to show um, if you haven't been involved maybe with uh, this type of program before, um, it's important just to show the project life cycle uh, and where we are on that journey starting today. So we're very much at the top of the slide there in terms of pre-development. We're looking to elaborate on our project ideas, um, and hopefully today you'll get more information to allow you to do that. Um, you'll then be able to develop your concept notes if you think there's a fit with your idea and the program, and that will be something then that you can share with Miriam uh, in terms of getting feedback um, to allow you to decide whether this is something that you want to pursue uh, further. And then we'll move on, we'll have the call for applications, and that will happen later this year. Um, and then, if you're successful then, obviously then you enter into contracting and starting your project, and then you'll implement your project on the basis of what's been approved in your application, uh, and any conditions that are set by SUPB or the steering committee that's recommended your project for approval, and then straight through to project closure. So just think it's a useful thing just to refer back to and you know, just see where you are in terms of uh, this particular journey and the life cycle of a project. So at this point, um, I'm going to welcome, I'm not sure if you're coming up together or it's two separate, but I'm going to welcome uh, Mary uh, and Jacqueline McDevitt. Uh, so Mary Halley from the Department of Health in Ireland and Jacqueline McDevitt from the Department of Health in Northern Ireland. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. So, good morning everybody. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, I'm Jacqueline and I will try not to wreck the desk here. Absolutely delighted to be here jointly presenting with my colleague from Ireland, Mary T, um, uh, to outline the key uh, health and social care policy areas of relevance for Peace Plus in terms of both departments. I'd also like to thank SEUPB colleagues for the opportunity to come along and speak to you today. And I want to thank all of you for taking time out of what I know will be very, very busy schedules to support this event and the significant funding opportunity associated with it, particularly in terms of tackling such a significant um, healthcare issue that we have in, in addiction and substance use. So moving on to the next slide, very brief overview of the Department of Health in Northern Ireland. Our department is one of nine government departments 
and it has policy and legislative responsibility across three areas, and that's health and social care, including hospitals, primary care, community health, and personal social services. Public health, for incorporating the promotion and protection of health and well-being across Northern Ireland's population, and public safety, which includes fire and rescue services. Within our department, there are four business groups, with healthcare policy being one of these. The department also has five professional groups, each led by uh, a chief um, professional officer, and that includes the chief medical officers group, the Office of Social Services, nursing, nursery midwifery and allied health professionals, dental services and pharmaceutical advice and services. So that brings us to directorate level, and the branch I work in sits within a relatively new directorate for transformation, sponsorship and EU. And while our branch does not have a policy making role, we do engage very closely with policy colleagues in the course of our work as we rely on their expertise to help us progress the work of the branch. So I'd just like you to have a look at uh, our mission statement and particularly the words in bold, which should provide some context for potential Peace Plus project proposals and how they link to departmental aims and policies. It's also worth noting you will find reference, often frequent, to these phrases and words regarding the collaborative health and social care theme within the Peace Plus programme. You can find that on the SEUPB website and also within the call document that uh, Declan was referencing earlier. So on to our departmental uh, priorities and values. With regard to ensuring that project proposals for the 17 million euros worth of funding associated with this investment area align with our priorities in the department and our values, I'm going to focus on several key policy documents, the aims of which are reflected in Peace Plus. Bear in mind too, however, that while I'm referencing the draft programme for government, new decade, new approach, and other high level reports, Strategies of particular importance to this call, which Mary T will also reference later, include reducing harm, supporting recovery, a health-led response to drug and alcohol use in Ireland, 2017 to 2025, and Northern Ireland's own 10-year substance use strategy, preventing harm, empowering recovery, and that was launched in September 2021. So Northern Ireland's draft programme for government framework sets out a wide range of policy ambitions for our society. They're generational in nature and aim to address major societal challenges, in this case problematic or harmful substance use and the linkages, linkages between these behaviours and mental health. Again, to provide focus for how this investment area aligns with DOH policy, consider the majority of the key priority areas of programme for government and how they map to the five outcomes of Northern Ireland's substance use strategy, which seeks to prevent and address the harm caused by substance use and to support recovery. So for example, access to health can be mapped across to outcome C. People have access to high quality treatment and support services, and that's outcome C of Northern Ireland's substance use strategy. Inclusion and tackling disadvantage, meanwhile, can be mapped across to outcome D people are empowered and supported on their recovery journey. Be mindful also that while many of the key priority areas within Programme for Government span the policy objectives of several departments and the importance of cross-departmental engagement in these areas to ensure a joined up approach to delivery. So a key principle of New Decade, New Approach, which underpinned the restoration of devolved government in Northern Ireland in 2020, has been reform and transformation of the health service. This includes action on waiting times and delivering on health and social care reforms set out in the 2016 VAGOA Systems Not Structures Review and the department's response to this health and wellbeing 2026 delivering together. Again, I. I would encourage you all to have a look at those documents if you haven't yet had a chance to. A quick glance at the contents page of Health and Wellbeing Delivering Together again flags up recurring themes already mentioned regarding the need to address health inequalities and building capacity in communities and prevention. These themes emphasise through the extracts from New Decade New Approach which are on the slide similarly map directly to the three remaining outcomes of Northern Ireland's 10-year substance use strategy. 
which are to ensure, with outcome A, that through prevention and reduced availability of sub substances, fewer people are at risk of harm from the use of alcohol and other drugs across their lives. Outcome B, meanwhile, is about ensuring a reduction in the harm caused by substance use. And outcome E of the, the Northern Ireland Substance Use Strategy is about effective implementation and governance, workforce development, evaluation, and research that supports the reduction of substance use and related harm. So very briefly on our, on our branch, and I'm delighted to be here today with my head of branch, um, David. Um, uh, hey, if there are any difficult questions, David, I'm just gonna <laughs> direct them to you. So our branch was established in autumn 2022, and it's the newest in the directorate that I referenced earlier. Um, transformation sponsorship and EU and other relatively new directorate and while we cover various work areas today's focus is obviously on peace plus however given the shared challenges we all face regarding increasing demand and stakeholder expectations along with finite and dimin diminishing resources it does make sense as you'll be aware to take an outward looking collaborative approach to working with a wide range of stakeholders to address these challenges both locally and globally it also helps to avoid duplication of effort, pool expertise to address a shared problem and ensure maximum utilization of scarce resources, which is where that cross-border working and collaborative health and social care ethos is so important in terms of Peace Plus. And we've seen this through the many demonstrable uh, successes of interreg and peace programs, the predecessors to Peace Plus. So it may help to bear all of this in mind when considering your potential cross-border partners. And while we're here to focus on Peace Plus, I would like to illustrate how engagement in interreg and peace programs um, has facilitated the showcasing of successful cross-border healthcare projects between Ireland and Northern Ireland at European level. And it's really nice to be able to share that good news outside of Northern Ireland. And we've done this through membership of a couple of European networks, including Eurega and the reference site Collaborative Network and Active and Healthy Aging. And as you'll be aware from your own experiences, there's much to share and much to learn, both from our immediate neighbours and regions further af afield facing similar global healthcare challenges with substance use and associated mental health challenges clearly being one of these. So on to my last slide for the time being. This is a picture from the Reference Site Collaborative Network Award Ceremony in October 22, where all four UK nations were awarded the maximum four-star accreditation for their efforts with a right wide range of stakeholders in their respective regions, including service users, in promoting a lifelong approach to active and healthy aging. And there are about 70 European regions in this network. And again, I put this up because it just emphasizes the importance of that joined up collaborative working with people with shared, um, you know, who face uh, similar shared challenges. So thank you for your attention. I'm now going to hand you over to Mary T for the next part. Morning, everyone. Thanks, Jacqueline and Jacqueline and Miriam for the opportunity to be here on behalf of the Department of Health. Sorry. Um, the department's vision is a healthier Ireland with improved health and well-being for all, with the right, right care delivered in the right place at the right time. The department's mission is supporting people to live healthy and in independent lives by providing leadership and policy direction for the health service to improve health outcomes, ensuring the delivery of high quality, safe health and social care by undertaking governance and performance oversight to ensure accountable and quality services, creating a more responsive, integrated and people-centered health and social care service by collaborating to achieve health priorities to contribute to the wider social and economic goals and promoting to effective and efficient management of health and social care services, ensuring the best value for health system resources by creating an organisation environment where high performance is achieved, collaborative work is valued and staff knowledge and skills are developed and deployed. The department's strategic priorities include promoting public health, expanding and integrating care in the community, making access to healthcare fairer and faster, improving oversight and partnership in the sector, expanding the or an organization fit for the future. The department will achieve these priorities 
with empower teams and cross-functional working, data technology and digitization, funding structures and infrastructure, innovation, stakeholder collaboration and alignment. These can all be aligned, applied to supporting the development of your Peace Plus programs. Sorry. The department serves the public and the ministers for health, ministers of state and the government by uh, the functions uh, listed there. As you can see, there's a broad range of work in accordance with our functions. We're a relatively small department with 600 staff and the HSC has over 100,000 people employed. The department has significant responsibility and accountability for expenditure of one of the most of the largest budgets in government. Last year, or this year, it was allocated 23.4 billion. Of that, 443 million is to ensure the re uh, reduction in waiting lists and facilitate access to care. The department is led by Minister for Health, Stephen Donnelly, with the support of Ministers of State, Mary Butler, responsible for mental health and older people, and Hildegard Nocton, Minister of State, with responsibility for public health, well-being, and the national drug strategy. The department is organized into nine divisions, including the Office of the Chief Medical Officer and the Office of the Chief Nursing Officer. The department engages with its agencies, partners across government and public and private sector organizations, including the Health Service Executive, the Mental Health Commission, the Health Research Board, and the Health, Health Product Regulatory Authority. Some key, some key Department of Health policies include Salon to Care. In July 2018, government approved the Salon to Care Implementation Strategy. The Salon to Care Action Plan 2022 sets out the ongoing reform priorities aligned with the Salon to Care Implementation Strategy and Action Plan 2021 to 2023. The plan focuses on the implementation of two key reform programs, improving safe and timely access to care and promoting health and well-being and addressing health inequalities towards universal health care. The Healthy Ireland Framework was launched in 2013. It provided for the first time a cross-government focus to deliver the vision of a healthy Ireland where everyone can enjoy physical and mental health and well-being to their full potential. Well-being is valued and supported at every level of society and is everyone's responsibility. It is based on four key goals, including to reduce health inequalities and to create an environment where every individual and sector of society can play their part in achieving a healthy Ireland. Other key department policy policies that may be of interest include sharing the, the vision and the Mental Health Act. Some key uh, priorities in Ireland are the programme for government, which was launched in 2020 following the formation of the coalition government it includes 12 missions one of which is the universal health care mission and that has seven key objectives including a healthier future mental health a health-led approach to drug misuse and age-friendly ireland Project Ireland 2040 is the government's long-term overarching strategy to making Ireland a better country for all and to build a more resilient and sustainable future. The National Development Plan is the largest plan ever delivered in the history of the state with 165 billion allocated to it. Its focus is on priority solutions to strengthening housing, climate, transport, healthcare, jobs growth, in every region and economic renewal for the decade ahead. The Shared Island Initiative seeks to harness the full potential of the Good Friday Agreement, enhance cooperation, connection, and mutual understanding on the island to build consensus around a shared future. This will be achieved through working with the Northern Ireland Executive and the British Irish Government to address strategic challenges faced on the island of Ireland. Further developing the all-Ireland economy, uh, deepening north-south cooperation and investing in the northwest and border regions. 
fostering constructive and inclusive dialogue and a cons comprehensive program of research to support the building of consensus around a shared future on the island. In Budget 2021, the Government established the Shared Island Fund, committing £500 million in capital funding out to 2025, ring-fenced for investment in collaborative north-south projects to deliver key cross-border initiatives and objectives as set out in the programme for Government. In November 2022, as part of the revised National Development Plan, the Government committed to extending the Shared Island Fund out to 2030, doubling the commitment to one billion and set out investment priorities for the decade ahead to work through all island partnerships to build a more connected, prosperous and sustainable island for all. Just a quick run through on the team that I'm sit within. So North South EU and International Unit sits within the research and development division in the department. There are 10 people working within the unit and we are supported by two colleagues in the Perm representative in Brussels and one in Geneva. Our remit in the team is broken down into three work areas. So North, South and UK team, most prevalent to the work of today's discussion, which my uh, colleague Lorna Conway, who couldn't be here today, and uh, myself were uh, working on. We're responsible for the North South cooperation, including the North South Ministerial Council, EU funding programmes such as Interreg and Peace Plus, and shared island initiatives. UK relations, uh, Brexit, EU, UK relations, and enterprise engagement. Other teams in the unit include the EU and bilateral team, support, which supports EU um, councils, committees, working parties and our international team coordinate the department's engagement at an international level, including the World Health Organization, both EU at an EU and global level, and the United Nations, including the Council of Europe. I'll hand you back to Jacqueline now. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mary T. So, I'm just going to spend a little time uh, looking at the background of the current Interreg 5A programme, which along with previous peace and Interreg programmes has provided the inspiration for Peace Plus, as we've mentioned before. So the departments of health in, in the north and, uh, and in the south collaborate extensively as accountable departments for the health themes of EU-funded programmes for the border counties of Ireland and the whole of the north of Ireland. Currently, Interreg FAG is completing. Um, it has run on a little longer uh, because of the, the COVID pandemic, but uh, within Interreg 5A, just under 60 million euro uh, has been allocated across 10 projects, and I'll, I'll let you see what those 10 projects are in a moment. I've included some examples here uh, of how projects can often exceed their original targets, uh, just to emphasize how successful, successful these projects can be. And the key learning um, from Interreg 5 and the importance um, of digital innovation and adaptability during COVID-19, along with uh, the importance of mental health resilience programs to tackle social isolation, both emotionally and physically, very much came to the fore during uh, evaluation of Interreg 5A. So this is just uh, a slide which illustrates the, the, the diversity of programmes, uh, of projects that have been funded through Interreg 5, uh, 5A. And I'd just like to, to maybe reference acute services, which, you know, obviously quite different from something like medicines management, uh, management of polypharmacy and adherence through the years. Again, quite different, again, from the I Recovery Project, which tackles mental health issues through co-production. And there's plenty of information about the, these projects available on, uh, on both the project websites, but also through SEUPB. So to come back again to why we're here today, the Peace Plus program, you'll be aware that there's 97 million overall invested in uh, 4.1A, this investment area for collaborative health and social care. 80 million pound has, is associated with Action One, and we previously had a workshop for this in December. And if any of you are interested in seeing recordings or slides from this workshop, again, you'll find them on the SEUPB website. Today's uh, 
workshop is about action two and the 17 million euro associated with the addiction treatment call. So the departments in uh, the north and south of Ireland, as I said earlier, we act as accountable departments and we will assess programme development and the progress of successful projects through the life cycle of the programme. And we do this in conjunction with a wide range of stakeholders. Your applications should therefore align with the relevant government and EU strategies policies, which Mary T and I have been taking you through today. They should assess the potential for proposals to continue into the future with the potential for mainstreaming. And also they should be supported by evidence and include regular evaluation processes. And the key thing to emphasize in terms of this slide is that when you're putting together your project proposals, try and ensure that they meet the EU policy objective of a more social and inclusive Europe implementing the European pillar of social rights. Additionally, they should meet our departmental specific object objectives of ensuring equal access to healthcare and fostering resilience of health systems, including primary care and pro promoting the transition from institutional to family and community-based care. And similarly, you should be thinking about that when you're thinking of what is my project going to look like in terms of outcomes and results. So back to... Mary T, thank you. Thanks. Okay. So as Jacqueline said, in relation to your proposals, uh, some, some key considerations to factor into your um, planning is the importance of an integrated approach, the adoption of new technologies to improve access to services, the need to tackle health inequalities, the opportunity to develop and deliver cross-border health and social care research initiatives, the requirement for specific mental health interventions, projects should add, add value to existing services and programs act as a test bed for new pilot projects. Some further considerations when developing proposals include potential synergies with key priorities from the first call. For example, suicide prevention and mental health for both children and adults. Programs being underpinned by three horizontal principles, sustainable development, non-discrimination and equality between men and women, and equal opportunities. Collabor collaboration opportunities across other teams, uh, for example, uh, empowering and investing in young people uh, under uh, thematic area three. Types of community health and social care um, actions to be supported. Uh, initiatives to deliver cross-community and cross-border collaborative approaches to health and social care delivery uh, in clinical areas identified as most suitable to a cross-border service delivery model. The development of and implementation of support and cooperation services on a cross-border basis for community and voluntary organizations involved in the provision of health and social care services within their own communities. Key to this uh, call is addiction services. The, men the health and mental well-being of citizens and communities has been impacted by the trauma arising from the troubles, resulting in higher rates of mental health illness than in other parts of the UK. Research in this area highlights a need to support uh, specific mental health interventions, especially within those areas where there are benefits to collaborative cross-border management approaches. Suitable areas identified include addiction services and suicide prevention initiatives. Addiction is defined as an inability to stop using a substance or engaging in a behavior even though it is causing psychological and physical harm. Initiatives through Peace Plus, Peace Plus should be complementary to existing strategies and policies which we've outlined earlier. Uh, these include reducing harm, supporting recovery, a health-led response to drugs and alcohol use in Ireland 2017 to 2025 
Northern Ireland's 10-year substance use strategy, Preventing Harm, Empowering Recovery, launched in September 2021. It is will also be important to ensure that any related investment reflects the policy focus of dual diagnosis. This refers to assessment and treatment of any interlinking mental health conditions in those presenting with addiction issues. Progress has been made in this regard in Northern Ireland with the support of, uh, in this regard in Ireland, with the opportunity to share learning and best practice with colleagues in Northern Ireland. I hand you back to Jacqueline now. Thank you. And if you're wondering why we've been doing this back and forth, um, it's very symbolic. We just really want to get the message across about how closely it's not because Mary T are trying to increase our steps or anything. We just really want to get across how how much we value being able to work um, uh, the two departments together. Um, and we've been doing it, this, the particular teams involved have been doing it for the last couple of years, Mary T, I think. And it is such a privilege and such a, a really great way to be able to help um, uh, try and address very significant healthcare challenges, which, which both, both jurisdictions face. So, we thought that we, when we were given the opportunity pr to present, we said to, to Declan and Miriam, well, can, can we do it together? Because that then just really emphasizes how committed we are to this. So um, this is the last slide. And just to summarize on behalf of both the, de the departments. So the purpose of this 17 million pound um, investment uh, is to build upon existing and new cross-border collaborative approaches to health and social care delivery models. It's to deliver an increased number of episodes of care across the programme area to improve health and mental well-being aimed at reducing addiction and substance use issues in the region. Um, and it's also to support the development of innovative community-based healthcare interventions which complement statutory provision, including social enterprise models. The project should therefore be cross-border in nature by, for example, using staff from both sides of the border being open to users on either, on either side of the border and using a shared approach uh, or design, design on both sides of the border. And can I just add two additional um, points as well, which Mary T has already kindly um, referenced. When you're putting together proposals, be very conscious of the importance of how is this going to provide additional value and also of the project acting as a, a test bed for new ways of working which might support, which ideally will support statutory provision. And lastly, health and social care interventions, services and initiatives should be new and not continuations of existing services. So thank you very much for your attention, much, much appreciated. Uh, can I just add, are you going to reference functional areas, Miriam, yes, is that okay? Right, I'll just be quiet now and thank you again for your attention. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jacqueline and, and Mary, um, for the very informative presentations and the information that's provided there. And that obviously will be very helpful, particularly around the policies and strategies as you develop your concept and your project idea. Um, SUPB, of course, are, are responsible for the management of the application and assessment process and all of the guidance around this. Um, uh, we'll obviously work closely with with the two departments in terms of you know the projects that come in and the applications you know as part of that uh, assessment process there will be a lot more guidance i think mary and jacqueline have touched on on some of the key areas you know in terms of that add value dimension you know in terms of the horizontal principles um you know the importance of the cross the cross border north south dimension you know, all of that will obviously be assessed and there will be detailed guidance around that as well that will be published, uh, published shortly, which will also be very helpful for you. Um, I think Jacqueline touched on it as well, just to, to kind of be clear, because I see a lot of people kind of trying to make notes and trying to keep up with the presentations and that. All of this will be published on our website over the next number of days as well. So um, today's session is being videoed uh, and the presentations will be available. So you can go back at your own sort of leisure um, uh, and reflect on some of the information uh, that you've heard, you've heard today. A couple of other points just to pick up on just before I ask Miriam uh, to come up for her uh, presentation. Um, it was mentioned as well just around evaluation uh, and uh, around the, the evaluation of the current programs. 
Um, and there is a lot of good information as well, uh, and I think it's useful to go back and look at that. That's all on our website, uh, and indeed on the project websites as well. Um, one thing that we're very much pushing this time around um, is around the use of technology uh, and some of that emerging uh, advanced technology that's there, and really that's right across the program. Um, we had a speaker um, uh, a number of weeks ago that we had opened it up to potential applicants to come in here, and it's also on our website, just around AI and some of that emerging technology that's going to really be hitting us over the next number of years. And we really want every project really to be considering that. You know, what's the possibilities? What's the feasibility um, of some of that technology that's emerging and how that can be incorporated in, in the projects? Of course, it may not always be have a place. But it's just important that um, you're, you're aware of that, and you know that will be touched on uh, within the calls and the guidance that, that we issue uh, as well. So, look at, at this point, um, I'm going to pass over to Miriam Ferrin, and Miriam, as I said, is going to be conducting the review and the concept no process over the next number of weeks. So, she's going to be your key contact. Miriam will be your key contact from this point uh, forward. So, over to you, Miriam. Thank you. Sorry. Just not in here. Good morning, everybody. Uh, lovely be to be here. I'm really pleased to be looking after this area. I see some familiar faces, and I um, look forward to meeting lots of you over the coming months and working with you moving forward. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you just a very brief overview of the investment area itself. I'm going to talk to you about the pre-development support process and what that uh, entails. And then I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of the concept note, which happily is very short and concise, but it'll just give you a bit of uh, advice in terms of how to complete that. Okay? So, in terms of uh, the program itself, um, the, sp inter the specific objective for this area is to ensure equal access to health care and fostering resilience of health systems. And that will result in an increase in the number of episodes of care delivered on a cross-border basis. It might be better just if I could get to the mic and readjust it. Okay. So what does uh, collaborative health and social care seek to achieve? Uh, this investment area is an important area in which collaborative cross-border approaches are proven to deliver considerable benefits to the citizen and the programme area. And how is that going to be done? Through building on existing and new collaborative relationships and services on a cross-border basis. So, in terms of who can apply uh, in this area, we're expecting a kind of a breadth of people to be interested in this area from statutory agencies who work in it and uh, the community and voluntary sector as well. But ultimately, any suitable cross-border partnership with the capacity to deliver on all of the outputs, results and actions uh, involved can come forward. A partnership which is able to develop solutions that have the capacity to influence and improve the health and well-being of people living in our program area. And any partnership that is able uh, to develop and implement the project within the required time frame. And we are asking people to build and develop projects that will be delivered over a four-year period. So, as Jacqueline outlined, there are two actions under 4.1. Um, the information for Action 1 you'll be able to access on the website, but this particular uh, session is about Action 2, and that's specific to addiction services. So. Action two is initiatives to include the development and delivery of new treatment facilities and programs designed to address the trauma of the troubles on the health and mental well-being of citizens and communities by adopting a strengths-based cross-community and cross-border mental and emotional resilience and recovery model. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more about what that could mean in a moment. Okay, so... Um, I think Jacqueline and Mary T have been uh, giving you quite a good overview in terms of some of the key considerations. Just to touch on that again, what we're looking for is uh, an integrated approach. I think Mary T referenced particularly the dual diagnosis, obviously uh, the scoping that we've done with the departments, uh, colleagues in the departments, really has highlighted that addiction is not a standalone issue, 
and there are mental health uh, challenges that often underpin addiction in, uh, issues. So we'd want to kind of see how you would manage that. As Declan mentioned, the adoption of new technologies to improve access to services. Across all of our uh, interventions in this area, we do want to see people working to tackle health inequalities as much as possible. And we want to see, as with all the investment areas in Peace Plus, a focus on peace and prosperity. And particularly within this investment area, we're looking at some of that, uh, the legacy issues. So how addiction and the challenge of addiction in our program area has been impacted by legacy issues and trans intergenerational uh, trauma. So a focus on that as well. The budget available for this particular uh, area is 17 million, and that's inclusive of 13.6 million from the ERDF program and 3.4 million uh, from match funding from the government, both governments. 100% of eligible project costs can be sought, and you'll see further information on this in the call document once that's released. So Peace Plus is a result-orientated program. So across all investment areas, there are result or output and result indicators that have been uh, established for each area. In relation to 4.1, action two, the output indicator is two jointly developed solutions. And the result indicator is 2,000 beneficiaries of jointly developed and delivered health and social care solutions. So. Anything that you design or come forward as a concept, you have to outline the extent to which your project and your idea will make a contribution to achieving those result and output indicators. Um, I think important to note that the 2,000, the target of, of 2,000 beneficiaries um, really kind of speaks to the challenges and the duration and intensity required in terms of episodes of care specific to this clinical area. As Declan has mentioned, they're very important, and you know we want to. These are it's a really important and uh, you know a wonderful opportunity to invest and test new ideas. We need you to be demonstrating how they are making impact, measuring the change. So that's a really important consideration in your project design. Okay, so in terms of the pre-application support concept note. Um, Fair to say that you, you do not, anybody can come forward and submit a full application without going through this process, but this is my, I'm ashamed to say, third program cycle, and I think this is a wonderful opportunity to actually interface with the funder, get really good advice in terms of, A, if this is the right investment area for you, and B, how you might seek to strengthen your uh, application moving forward. And any of the work that you do now at this stage will, trust me, play real dividend when you come to do your full application. So, uh, in terms of how the process works, uh, this is a really good opportunity to come forward, give us your initial ideas, and find out very early on if 4.1 is the right investment area for you, and if not, and if appropriate, be signposted to other uh, parts of the program. I am pleased to see that some people like signposted to this area are here today. So get advice in terms of your specific project, how that might be strengthened and how you can move forward. Look at who um, else that you might want to work with, who else is interested in this area that it might be you know, important and beneficial for you to collaborate with. We are in the business of uh, partnerships, so where we see opportunities to do that, we do signpost people. Okay. So in terms of how to build a strong uh, proposal, so from today, anybody interested in this area can complete and submit a concept note for comment, advice, and support. And I imagine that's already on the website, Cathy, it is? Yes, it is. So it's a very concise overview um, of what will really be a condensed version of what will be the full application. So it includes some of the questions you'll have to ask, answer in a full application, but not all of those. Um, it'll really help you put in place the foundations of your project so that you're better prepared when the call opens. Important to say this is, first of all, not mandatory. It is not a formal application, so you're not scored in any way. It's about really getting advice 
and helping you to uh, strengthen what it is. It is not scored, happily for me. Okay, so as I say, the good news is it's fairly uncomplicated and short. Uh, the form itself is three pages with one page of uh, guidance. Uh, there are five questions, well, six questions, a high-level overview of your project and five other questions. We do ask you to fit, we've asked you to kind of stay within a three to 500 word limit. I would ask you to do that if you can. I know it can be challenging and people are so enthusiastic about their project, but the kind of, there's a challenge to the brevity in, you know, describing your project in a concise, accessible way it makes it easier for me to get uh, to, the, to the bones of that. Um, Advice is not just available post-completion and post-submission of your concept note. I'm happy to speak to anybody, and I have in other uh, areas as well. People have found it beneficial to give me a call or speak to me in advance and talk me through what they're thinking of before they put it in, and then we can pick up in the conversation thereafter. So, would ask you as well to return your concept note by the uh, 14th of July, um, to my email address, which is listed there. Okay, so just in terms of the questions, uh, so say the first is a very high level overview of your project. Uh, we do ask you to identify, uh, how, uh, outline how the need for your project has been identified. Um, and I would ask, I mean, ask you to consider not just what the need for investment in the area of addiction is, because we have established that working with our colleagues here in both the departments. While you can highlight that, it's also particularly important to highlight what the need for your specific approach is, and that will really kind of distinguish your uh, project as well. Important then to outline how your project aligns with Peace Plus, in particular 4.1, um, and also to indicate how it aligns with the strategic context in both Ireland and Northern Ireland in terms of health. And our colleagues from the departments have, have highlighted that and given you quite a bit of resource to, uh, to look at there. You do need to outline what the result and output indicators of your project will be, okay? Um, pr supported projects should contribute to a more efficient delivery of health and social care services across the program area. Ensure people have access to quality care, uh, healthcare and social services in the most appropriate setting to their needs. And as Jacqueline has mentioned, if possible, build upon existing collaborative cross-border relationships and service provision. So you're adding value to what uh, is, is happening. Um, in terms of the continuation of that, again, we are looking for how your project has been informed by or aligns to best practice by, as we say, incorporating that integrated approach, that focus on dual diagnosis, adopting technologies where that uh, is suitable, how your project tackles health inequalities, and again, how it aligns uh, with the peace program objectives and that contribution to peace and prosperity. Okay. so. Question two is about the contribution of your project to the result and output indicators set for 4.1 action two. So you need to indicate the extent to which your project contributes to one or more jointly developed solutions and the number of beneficiaries who uh, will experience episodes of care in relation to your project. That's really important. Question three is all about cross-community and cross-border collaboration. We do uh, want you to give us an indication of the geographical reach of your particular project, so what areas will be involved. We need to know the extent to which your uh, project is cross-border on the basis of, as Jacqueline has said, like using staff from both sides of the border, uh, being de jointly developed and delivered, also being open to users uh, on either side of the border and using that shared approach. We also uh, would value, uh, you know, you bringing forward the extent to which your project is cross-community as well. In terms of question four, it's very important that this much needed investment is added value, adding value, that it's not duplicating or displacing any existing provision. So very important that you outline to us the extent to which you've identified any potential for duplication and displacement, um, and that you have incorporated kind of mitigating measures to ensure that, that the, uh, 
those issues are addressed. If your project is complementing uh, and building on other important investment uh, in this area, again, important for you to highlight that. So question five is all about the proposed team. So, you know, who will be leading and partnering um, in this project and how those arrangements will be managed. So, if you could give us an overview of the staffing, so who's doing what, the extent to which they are suitably experienced to be delivering out on this particular work, giving us some kind of assurance that you have the necessary capacity to deliver, that you have considered the kind of practical arrangements for what will be a cross-border project of scale, uh, that you have outlined, and I think this is very important, that people come forward, and I see this all the time in, in concept notes, that uh, partners are listed, but it's important for us to understand what the rationale behind particular partners being involved. Why are, you know, why are they the best people to be involved? What will they be doing? So if you can give us some information on that outline the extent uh, to which you may need any technical support uh, and what the structure of that partnership is. If you have experience of uh, working together previously on European or other projects, important that you give us you know, an indication uh, of that. And also risk assessment that you've incorporated any potential your, uh, risks and, and how, again, you would mitigate those. So, section six is value for money. Value for money, very important. It is a scored criterion within, uh, or will be a scored criterion within the full application. Important that you demonstrate to us that you are maximizing the, the public money available in terms of your staff and, and positions that they are advertised at the appropriate grade, uh, you know, that tenders are competitively managed, etc. We're not looking for a full budget at this stage, but you know, fairly high level uh, budget is sufficient. But if you could provide us with the assumptions that you've used to generate that budget, it would be very helpful. Um, value for money is not obviously all about cost, it's about impact. So we want to see the value uh, in terms of value for money. It's very important for us to see the, the immediate and longer term value of your particular project. And as Jacqueline has outlined there, the extent to which that could be mainstreamed moving forward, what is the extent of your exit strategy important in, in the context of value for money as well. Okay, just uh, a, you know, a brief word about um, anybody considering um, being a lead partner in this area. I'm happy to speak to, to you when you come forward. But I think it's sufficient to say that it is a considerable undertaking in terms of the responsibilities that a lead partner uh, is assuming. And it really is for every, you know, the oversight of every particular aspect of the project in terms of all of the coordination, um, the financial management, the reporting, managing any communications associated with the project, training requirements, and ensuring that policies and procedures um, are in place and particularly within I suppose the financial management aspect there to be sure that you know that the, the organizations in in a, a position to manage again what will be a, 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 a cross-border project of scale and an associated uh, financial scale as well okay so other things to bear in mind again this is just we do have uh, we do have some time to kind of think through and really consider what it is you would be, be bringing forward if that is suitable to full application. So now's the time to really think about what it is you want to do to, you know, take time to build your partnership, be clear on who's doing what, consider things like how you will evaluate your project, be proportionate, um, you know, and my experience is from, from looking at other um, concept notes, we do want people to be very ambitious, but we want them to be realistic as well. So just consider the scale of your particular project. Again, how you might manage associated cash flows and have clarity of purpose. Um, really, your project must always focus on building peace and prosperity uh, for this program area. Okay, so in terms of timescales for the pre-development support, so. As I said, you can download the concept note from today, um, and we would ask you to submit that by the 14th of July. We will aim, and normally that isn't an issue, but I, I am, there's a, 
will be back from holiday fairly soon after you submit and we will do our very best to get back to you. Our working uh, assumption is that we come back to you, we'll acknowledge your uh, project and we'll work with you in terms of timescales, but we will aim to be back in contact with you within 15 working days. And you know, I will give you as much support and guidance uh, as we can. We love to see people coming forward and giving us their, their energy and their ideas and we'll be as uh, equally giving back. So we look forward to that. Okay, so as Declan has mentioned, you know, further information will be available in due course. You will have the cooperation program, the program manual, the guide and the call for applications will be issued in due course. But be assured, you know, there is enough information within the concept note to guide you uh, at this stage. And anything else, I'm available to kind of any, answer any other questions you have at this stage. Okay, Declan. Thanks very much, Miriam. Um, <clears throat> and really, just to, to reiterate the point, you know, this is a really excellent opportunity, you know, to uh, engage with someone. Um, who's working on behalf of SUPP around this. So really, if you do see an opportunity here, now's the time to start that engagement process. I think Miriam alluded to the fact that she's going on holiday. So I think, so I think, I think you need to get her before she goes as well. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, no, thank you very much for that, Miriam. And um, you know, uh, as, as I've said earlier, all of this will be available again. So those slides that Miriam uh, has gone through, uh, we'll have on, on the website after today's event.